We are going to be in a few areas of Scripture today as we continue our study through the chronological course of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And even though we are not going book by book, uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, we are going chronologically verse by verse through these seven sayings. And so we're going to be in John's Gospel, chapter 19, John's Gospel 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as well as John chapter 12. Once again, John 19, 2 Corinthians 4, John chapter 12. As you're turning to those, uh, let me say how excited I am to return from the men's retreat. God is doing something great with your sons, with your uncles, with your husbands, with your brothers, uh, with your nephews. It was just such an exciting time to see with the Lord and how he is moving with some of the men in our church. We had over 150 guys. Uh, out there on Catalina Island, and uh, just excited about what the Lord is doing. Once again, John 19, 2 Corinthians 4, John chapter 12. Would you go with me to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts? Father, we are so grateful to be able to be together. We're so thankful to be in your church. We're so thankful that we get to learn the Word of God. And I pray that you would open up our heart and our mind, and you would awaken our spirit so that we can hear with spiritual ears and apply these truths to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever not finished a project? <laughs> Laughter gives you away. <laughs> Have you ever not finished a book? Now, I don't know about you, but how many pieces of projects do you have all over your house? or stored away in your closet or your garage that have yet to be completed. 23 years ago, I bought a sewing machine for my wife. We've moved eight times since I bought that sewing machine, different homes and different counties, and that sewing machine has yet to leave the box. Now, we've moved it <laughs> because she is going to be a seamstress. And so there are shorts in that box that have been there for 23 years. They're out of style. I don't want them anymore, Andrea. You are welcome. There are teddy bears of our children in that box because she is going to one day get to that project, right? Well, I'm the same way. And personally, I've had to come to a personal conclusion and decision in my life that I'm not going to buy anything else at Home Depot until I finish the project that I started. It's amazing the amount of money that I've saved in the last few months. But how many of you have books on your shelves that aren't completed yet? Like, you really want to read it, and you really engage, and you're going to finish that book. And I love going into pastor's offices because we all have libraries. Now, if you come into my office, I actually don't have a library. Um, it's in my iPad. And so all my books are in my iPad, and I've got 12 thousand books in my iPad. And I love going into pastor's offices because I'll just pick a random book in the library and I'll go, hey, how was this book? Not did you read it. How was this book? And I just want to know, is this just display or did you really read this? Because there's nothing more rewarding than when you finish a project or you complete a book. You just feel good about yourself, unlike Pastor Zach. You see, Pastor Zach bought a hundred-year-old home in San Pedro. And every time he finishes one project, something else in the house breaks. And there's another project to complete. And I keep telling him, this, uh, Pastor Rob went in and said, this is young man's house. You will have projects until you sell this house and give those projects to someone else. So you will never be able to say it is finished. My son, Micaiah, my oldest biological kid in time, my youngest, they love Legos. They love Legos. And so Christmas, I would buy them Legos. Well, one year, I brought Timon a Millennium Falcon. He's a Star Wars junkie, and I got him Millennium Falcon. It took him six hours Christmas Day to put the Millennium Falcon together. And when he was done, I heard in the living room, I'm finished! Because there's nothing more rewarding than finishing a project, than finishing a book. And about three minutes later, my daughter, Sayla, accidentally stepped on the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> there's nothing more hurtful than when you finished, it doesn't go well. It is finished? 
John chapter 19, would you pick it up with me in verse 28? Once again, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, he knew it was finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. We studied it last week. A vessel of wine of sour wine was sitting there. They filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it in his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And I know in our English language, there are three words that are represented, but this is just one Greek word to telestai. Just one word, but in this word, there is a wealth of meaning. It means to make an end, to be paid for, to complete, or to bring to perfection. In fact, this word, tetelestai, was written on every Roman receipt to let everyone know that the product or the property that you had was paid in full. And every word of the Savior was chosen, careful, and concise. And so we can begin to see as we understand the wealth of meaning in this word, why he would say, Tetelestai, it is finished. One author says, he put an end as a definition to our sins and their guilt. He paid the price of our redemption. He completed or finished the work that the Father had given him, and he finished the making of atonement for you and for me. You see, this one word, has a wealth of wisdom which Paul calls the glorious riches of Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what I'd like to do today is walk through the wealth of the meaning of this word. And the first thing that I would love for you to write down in your notes, it's a word of salvation. It's a word of salvation. You see, when Jesus said to Telestai, it was like my daughter calling me when she finished an exam. This was a word to his father. It was a word to his dad. It was a pronouncement that the Millennium Falcon, if I can relate the two stories for just a moment, it's finished. That the work was complete. And he was letting his dad know it was just the other day. My daughter Elia called me. She's in an expedited nursing program in Fort Lauderdale. She had a horrific test that was in front of her. It took two weeks of study and prep and memorization. And then her dad, her father got the call. Dad, I did it. It's finished. I got 100%. I got the highest grade in the class. And let me tell you who she told. She called her dad. She didn't call her mom. She called her dad. <laughs> she wanted me to know. It's finished. I did it. I studied I worked hard, and I got every answer right. I need to let you know something. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Let me tell you why. Because there was no way for any one of us to get to heaven. Every one of us from the moment we were born has broken the law of God. The law requires perfection perfection. It requires that you follow it to the T, every jot and every tittle, because the only way we can get to heaven is through perfection. And the law was God's requirement so that you could go to heaven. But the law was not there for you to make it to heaven. No, the law was there as a tutor, the Bible says. The law was there to show us that there was no way for any of us to get to heaven because no way possible for us to be perfect. The law was there to point us to the fact that we are in need of a Savior. Now, I need to let you know something about your pastor. I was a lifeguard on Fort Lauderdale Beach for five years. And that's how I kind of worked my way through college, and I worked on the weekends, and there I was. And I had rescues all the time. And let me tell you who the hardest person to rescue was, a man. Because when you, got a, when you got out to a woman, it was like, help! When you got to a guy, I'm good. Dude, you're actually drowning. Like, <laughs> you think you're good. So I never forget, I swam out to this guy, and as I'm swimming out there, he's like, he's really, like, he's going to go under at any given point. So I get out to him, I've got the buoy, and I'm the lifeguard. He can see that I'm coming to rescue him, and as soon as I get to him, he looks at me and goes, I'm good. <laughs> really? Watch this. 
So a little lifeguard trick. I back up in the water and I go to turn as if I'm going to leave him. Now, I'm not actually going to leave him. It's a lifeguard trick. So I back up, I turn a little bit, and he goes, help! (laughs) Help! That's the law. The law is kind of like the buoy, the lifeguard. It's just there to show you you're drowning and you really need help. There's no way you're going to be able to swim to shore and get to the shore of heaven on your own. You needed a Savior. And Jesus, he came and he did the work. And he worked hard. He fulfilled every jot and every tittle. And he did it without sin. He completely fulfilled every requirement of God in order for us to get into heaven. In fact, when he said it is finished, God was fully satisfied with the work of Jesus on the cross. Can you imagine me when my daughter called me and said, Dad, I'm finished. Think of the heavenly father looking at his son as on the cross. He says and whispers to him, it is finished. I did 100%, Dad. And I did everything. I followed the law perfectly. I was sinless. I did what you asked me to do. That's why we can be assured of our salvation. Because there's nothing that we can do to get to heaven. Because Jesus did everything for us. And he announces on the cross this proclamation of salvation. And he says, it is finished. Your price has been paid. Amen? Amen. Secondly... It's a word of completion. It's a word of completion. You see, the penalty for breaking the law of God is death. And when the Bible is referring to death, it's referring to our separation from God for an eternity. That's how the Bible is a spiritual definition of death. It is a separation from God for eternity. Jesus, because he lived the sinless life, he was the only human, the only God-man that would be able to pay the price of our sin. He paid the price of our sin by dying on a cross. He bore sin on him. And that's why he's just coming out of the three hours of darkness when God turned his back on his son who bore the sin of the world. Like last week, we pronounced, I thirst, as he thirsted for the connection with his Father, and he bore our sin. And there's two things in this message of completion, in this word of completion that we need to know. When he said it is finished, he finished the work for us so that we don't have to die so that we don't have to be separated. It's why Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He finished the work for us. And that's why I don't understand some of these churches who say, listen, you can come to Jesus, but first, you got to do this. I don't understand legalism. You see, we were born into sin. There is no way for us to, we, we start six feet under. There is no way to dig out of that grave. Jesus did the work for us. He lived the sinless life because he knew that we couldn't live the sinless life. And I don't understand why some churches have this Christ and. Well, come to Christ and. Come to Christ and. Well, come to Christ and make sure you do this and make sure you do this. When the only requirement of salvation is defined in the word of God. And if you don't know this scripture, maybe put it in your heart. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Your simple belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, you've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God doesn't want any one of us getting to heaven and say, well, I did this, and this is how I got to heaven. And I did this, and this is how I got to heaven. And then someone's sitting in the back and going, well, do you know what I did? Here's how I got here. You see, when we stand before the throne, it'll be the testimony of the saints that defeat the enemy. And our testimony is this. I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Now, I told you, 
It's a word of completion, and he's finished the work for us, but I need to explain something. Because we know he's finished the work for us, he will finish the work in us. You see, there's a salvation where there's nothing that we can do to get to heaven except believe in Jesus Christ. And once we believe, because he finished the work for us on the cross, the cross also guarantees that he will finish the work in us. Paul believed this so much that he wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, being confident of this, that he, uh, uh, excuse me, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you know you're a construction project? Do you realize that God is building your faith each and every day? And if he could accomplish the great work of salvation, you can trust him for the great work of sanctification. He is building your faith step by step. And you might say, well, I'm not there yet. Don't worry. He's got a lifetime to get you there. And if he is faithful to finish the work for us, he will be faithful to finish the work in us. Be careful, though. Be careful. Because sometimes in our faith, we begin to put rules and regulations on our relationship. You have to do this, and you have to do that, and you better dress like this. Uh, when I was in Africa, there was a guy that wouldn't come to church because he didn't have black shoes, because Christians have to wear black shoes to church. So you know what I did the next Sunday? I didn't wear shoes. I showed up without shoes, and I taught without shoes, and I invited my friend to church, and he came in his flip-flops, and I went without shoes, and I went to him afterwards. I go, do you know that Jesus loves your feet? He loves every aspect about you, and he wants to do a work in you. But be careful, Christian, that as you walk in the Lord, you don't turn your relationship into rules and regulation. Let me explain. I love my wife. We've been married 28 years. Did you hear her pray? I mean, love that woman. And because we're in a relationship, she doesn't have to tell me, you better not do this and you better not do that. And if you do this, you better not do that and don't do that. No, I love her. And because we're in relationship and I know her and I've been getting to know her over the last 28 years, I don't want to do anything that would hurt her. I don't want to do anything that would affect our relationship. You see, as I'm in the word of God, I've got a relationship with the Spirit. And because Jesus died for me, and he loves me, and I love him, I don't have to do what he asked me to do. I get to do what he asked me to do. I'm in love with him. And the Spirit of God is within me. And I no longer live by rules and regulations. I live by the law of the Spirit. Now, let me explain. Can you imagine if we had a law to follow in the 21st century. And the law was, you're allowed to be on social media for 29 minutes. You are allowed to watch sports for 32 minutes a day. You are allowed to go on three dates in your life and you better find your wife on the fourth. <laughs> Imagine if we had to dictate everything about your life and how you're to live your life. No, 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 we live by the law of the Spirit. The Spirit is inside us, and we have a relationship with God because of His Spirit. And as you're sitting in church learning the Word of God, the Spirit begins to speak to you. I just was out in the first, after the first service. A guy walks up to me, and he goes, I really love what you said. I'm so convicted. He told me what I said, and he walked out. I never said it. It was never in my sermon. Like, what the point that he was pulling out, I never communicated. But something in him, the Spirit moved, and he heard something from the Spirit, and he walked out convicted and guided in his walk with God because Jesus said, it is finished. And if he did the work for you, trust, he will do the work in you. Amen? Amen. It's a word of motivation. If you're taking note... It is finished. To tell us, die, it's a word of motivation. Hey, Christian, I know there's a lot of pressure out there. Some of you are getting ready to go back to school, and you don't have a God-fearing person in your grade. You've got teachers that are against God. 
Some of you go to work, and every other word is a colorful language. Some of you are moms, and you stay at home with children, and the days are long, and the years are short. Some of you are single moms and single dads. Some of you are teenagers trying to make it through life and the pressures that are out there and social media that's dictating to you how you should live your life. Listen, I know there's pressure out there, but I want you to stop for just a moment and hear it is finished. And I want you to think of what Christ went through to get to this place because he sets an example for us. Do you know that Jesus was going, he knew that he was going to die in his childhood? Psalm chapter 88, verse 15. It's a messianic psalm. Look at the screen. I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Jesus always knew he was heading towards the cross. I told you I was a swimmer in high school and college. And whenever I had a big event on Friday or Saturday, I started stressing about it two weeks before. And especially the Sunday night of the Friday that was coming. The anguish and the anxiety. My mom would give me scripture and she would pray over me. And I just would work myself up to get to this place of the swim meet on Friday because it gave me so much stress and pressure to get and to win. Imagine being Jesus and to know that your life's goal is to die on a Roman cross. And you've known it your whole life. Jesus was about his father's business. Jesus set his face as a flint. He would grow up in Nazareth. And there in Nazareth, everybody knew what Mary and Joseph had done before they got married. Everyone knew. Why do you think in John chapter 2, Jesus goes to Mar- Mary goes to Jesus at the wedding feast? In other words... All the families there. And Mary's responsible and goes to Jesus and says, hey, we got a problem. There's no more wine. And Jesus responds to her and says, what does this concern have to do with me? Your concern, what does it have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. You see, there's a reason that Mary went to Jesus. Jesus, the family's here. Like, I've told them your whole life that the Holy Spirit came upon me, but they laugh at me like they've laughed at me my whole life. I could have been stoned. People thought I committed adultery. Like, Jesus, this is the moment. The whole family's here. Like, do something Jesus-like so that everyone can see that you truly are the Son of God. Vindicate me. Jesus grew up with that. Imagine walking through the streets as a child and The kids making fun of you because they made fun of him all the way till when they accused him in the Sanhedrin. Jesus, his ministry would be marked with false accusations, ridicule, jealousy, attempts at public humiliation by the Pharisees. They met all night one time and they brought three accusations, three questions towards him so they could catch him and expose him to uh, uh, the Jews. Jesus... He'd be betrayed by his own, deserted by those who followed him, even denied by one of his closest friends at the hour of his greatest need. He'd be slandered. He'd be maligned, beaten, and tried. And despite it all, he would get to that cross no matter what came his way, and there he would whisper to his father, it is finished. During the war, World War II, Winston Spencer Churchill would speak to the nation, and at an hour when they were ready to give up, he said this, this is the lesson, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. He said, never give in, never give in. I am so grateful that our Savior set an example that despite what he went through, he never gave in. It's why Paul would write in Galatians, don't grow weary in doing good. 
I ask you to turn your, your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Would you go there with me now? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to see something because I believe from this statement, it is finished. The great apostle Paul would quote this by the Holy Spirit in Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, the gospel, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, now verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now look where Paul's focus is in verse 10. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Paul kept in his mind, if Jesus could do it, I'm going to do it. It is finish. Jesus set the example to finish the race that's set before us. Church, trials are going to come. Follow the way of our Savior and proclaim to your dying breath, I have finished the work, just like Jesus said in John chapter 17. So church, if you used to serve here, serve again. If you used to volunteer, volunteer again. Be able to say like Jesus, despite who's hurt you, despite what came in front of you, despite the obstacle that you stepped out of, even despite COVID. Be like Jesus. Get beyond the obstacle and be able to proclaim at the end of your life, I finished what you asked me to do. It is finished. Amen? Amen. It's a word of proclamation. This is a word of proclamation. Turn with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, I'm going to pick it up there in verse 30. John chapter 12, love to hear those pages of the Bible turning. John chapter 12, we'll pick it up in verse 30. Jesus answered and said, This voice, the voice that said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God the Father spoke to his Son in front of everybody. This voice did not come because of me, verse 30 says, but for your sake. Now, verse 31, John chapter 12. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will, listen to the will of God, will be cast out. You see, when Jesus whispered this to his father, it is finished. He was also making a proclamation in the halls of hell. It is finished you're done, you're out, you lost. To help us understand, the writer of Hebrews gives us a commentary on John chapter 12, verse 31. You'll see it on the screen. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 for your notes. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, in other words, he became a man, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil. You see, when Jesus whispered, it is finished to his father, he was making a proclamation to hell. He was proclaiming to the enemy that he had lost his power of death that was over us. He was letting him know that we no longer have to be victims of him praying upon us. This proclamation is one of victory. Satan is defeated. In fact, Paul writes in Colossians that the cross made a laughing stock of Satan because the power of the cross proclaims, Satan, you did not take my life. I willingly laid it down as the perfect sacrifice, sinless sacrifice as the Lamb of God. The enemy had to tap out with, it is finished. My grandfather grew up, uh, a Bahamian fellow. Um, he's gone home to be with the Lord. But uh, every Sunday, we'd come home from church, and we would see him watching WWF. <laughs> the Worldwide Wrestling. You know it. Now, let me tell you something about Bahamian culture, okay? When you go to a movie in the Bahamas, don't go to watch the movie. Watch us. We get so involved with the characters, you would think they were family. We give advice to the screen. 
We warn the screen. We get up. And if, if, if they're in a fight, we're in the fight in the aisle. Like, go to a Bahamian movie theater and just video us watching a movie, okay? I'm telling you, we just get engaged and involved. My grandfather was the same. We would come home from church. He would sit in front of the television watching WWF, and he was doing the moves. Like, he was slamming, dunking, and you could just see him. And whenever someone got wrestled down to the mat, he would hold them down in the mat just like this until they tapped out. Well, listen, church, we need to be like the Bahamians. Jesus was in the wrestling mat for 33 years with the enemy, and he took him down to the mat, and he held him down, and all the enemy could do was tap out. You win. Because Jesus said, it is finished. And as believers, we get to claim that victory as our own. Church, let me tell you something. Satan no longer has power over you. You live in victory because Jesus says it is finished. The problem is he's a liar. He lies to you and says to you, I got control of this. I got control of you. And he deceives you. But the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and look what he does. He's a scaredy cat. He will flee from you. He's terrified of the power of God in us. Now I know the word of God says that he comes across like. Now look at that word, it's very important. He comes like a roaring lion because that's the way we see him. He looks like a roaring lion. But let me tell you what he looks like to Jesus. A kitty cat. So you might hear, on earth, but in heaven, meow. Meow. Ah. He's just a little kitty cat. Because Jesus says, it is finished. Sin no longer reigns in you. Amen? Amen? But this final word, it's a word of inspiration. It is finished to Telestai. It's a word of inspiration because the Bible is the inspired word of God. And this word was determined from eternity past. You see, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the Bible says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, key phrase, slain from the foundation of the world. Do you know that the plan of God was always redemption? When Adam sinned in the garden, God wasn't in heaven going, oh no, we didn't think about this scenario. Jesus was slain since the foundation. He knew man would mess up. And even in your faith, do you know this? He knew that you could mess up. That's why he provided a way of redemption. That if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I was with the men this weekend. We were studying about the fact that we need to press on toward the goal. So many of us run our Christian marathon with our head backwards. You can't run a marathon looking back at your sin. You've got to press on looking at Jesus Christ. And the way that we do that, if we've messed up, I need to assure you of something. Though you may have messed up, God will never give up on you. He will never give up you. He always leaves the 99 to go and get the one. God knew man would fall. He knew that even as believers, that's why he always provides the way to come back into relationship. He says it's finished. But this moment on the cross, this moment on the cross was the culmination of the inspired word of God for hundreds of years prior. Do you realize there are over 400 prophecies and typologies that led Jesus to be able to say, it is finished, I've completed all. All! Over 400 typologies, prophecies and typologies. You see, written hundreds of years before by the inspired word of God, he would be born of a virgin. Check. He would be born in Bethlehem. Who would have known that? Micah did. He would be born of the tribe of Judah when all of the other tribes had been taken away to Assyria and only Judah was remaining as the last tribe in Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. Who knew that? God did. 
He would flee to Egypt as a young child, and he did. He ministered in Galilee hundreds of years before the prophets would say he'd heal the lame and he would make the blind to see. He typified as the more excellent sacrifice that Abel gave. He typified a shelter from the storm of divine judgment as Noah built the ark. He typified Isaac. Isaac typified Jesus, I mean, as the only begotten beloved son of God. He would fulfill each and every one of over 400. Now, I need to let you know what this means. There was a professor at Westmont University recently who did a study. The probability and possibility of one man fulfilling eight prophecies in the Bible. One man fulfilling just eight. Now remember, there's over 400. What is the probability? And they developed a mathematical equation to figure out if one man could just fulfill eight of the prophecies. And they came up with the probability that it would be 10 to the 17th power just for eight. I need to help you understand all those zeros. Imagine the state of Texas and throw a layer of keys on the entire state of Texas. Then take another truckloads of keys and layer a second set of keys over Texas. And I'm going to give you one master lock. And you have the opportunity to roam wherever you want in Texas and find the one key, and you get one chance, to find the one key that fits in that lock. That's only for eight And Jesus fulfilled over 400 when he said, it is finished. It's finished. Sometimes I don't believe that our faith is faith. It's just math. It's just figuring out how calculated God is. But there's more. There's something that we've got to understand about this inspiring word, it is finished. You see, confident of God's word that prophecy would be true, he said, it is finished, but there were still yet things to be finished. But he died. Let me explain. Zechariah tells us that his side had to be pierced. But he said, it is finished. Psalm 34 tells us that not one of his bones would be broken. But he was dead. How could he confirm that when he said, it is finished? You see, in a crucifixion, when you are on the cross and when they want you to die, they break your legs so that you can no longer lift up and take a breath. And so when they went to go bludgeon Jesus like they did the other two so that they would die, they instead pierced his side and they fulfilled scripture by not breaking any of his bones. Isaiah 53 tells us, that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. How could Jesus say it's finished when it wasn't finished? I'll tell you why. Even his death, when he said it is finished, he prophetically proclaimed that everything in God's word would come to pass. The proclamation is a prophetic inspiration. In other words, Jesus is pronouncing it is finished. He is letting us know whatever the scripture said that he will do, whatever he says, it will be done. And over 400 prophecies, let me tell you something. He fulfilled all of them literally. Every single one, born of a virgin, ministered in Galilee, fled to Egypt. They weren't a spiritual theological debate for Jesus. He just fulfilled them literally. And you can trust when he said it is finished. If there is a prophetic word that is yet to be fulfilled, it will be. So church, let me tell you something. He said he's coming back for his church. It is finished. He's coming back for his church. He said, he said that he will meet you in heaven as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And let me tell you something, though you're not dead yet, it is finished if you believe. Because whatever Jesus said, it is finished. And that's our faith. Amen. Amen. Father, we come before you and we ask now that your spirit would move in this place. We pray, God, that you would do your great work of salvation and sanctification in the lives of those 
that are listening. In your name, amen. Hey, church, now you pray. Someone asked me, why do you give the gospel at the end of every message? Because I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. And I would rather you linger a moment in prayer for one person. You see, when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it. There is no way for you to get to heaven. You couldn't make it. There is no amount of religiosity that you could put in your life that would get you to heaven. He knew it. He had to do the work for you. So he died on the cross so that you can go to heaven. You are saved by faith. And what that means, this work that he's done for you, is that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved. And this word, it is finished. It's a message of salvation to you. That one day you can be eternally with God. And he gives you the choice, the decision today. Fortunately, there is no decision after death. The decision is for today. Zach and I were driving here this morning, seven o'clock, car passing, intersection, T-boned. I guarantee that person didn't wake up this morning thinking, I'm gonna get hit today. Oh, come on, Pastor Chet. You're using something scary to get me into the kingdom. Let me tell you, I'll use whatever to get you into the kingdom because there is a reality of hell that separates you from God that I want no one in this room to ever experience. But he also wants to do a work in you. Listen, believer. He leaves the 99 always to get the one. You're not here by accident today. And I said something for you to hear. You might have messed up, but God ain't going to give up. And if you today want Jesus to do a work for you in salvation, or do a work in you with sanctification, and you want to turn your life around and go God's way, Pastor Pat's gonna meet me up here at the pulpit. And we're gonna call you to come forward like we do at all of our services. Let me tell you why. Because we wanna support you. The world won't. When you get up out of your seat, you're gonna hear us applause because we're with you. We're the church. And we want you to know this decision that you're making is gonna turn your life around. So today, if you want to turn your life around, I'm gonna ask you, to get up out of your seat when the music starts and come forward. We want to pray with you. As you get up out of your seat, you're going to see people applaud because they're having joy of what God's doing in your life. So as we sing this song, Christian, you be in prayer. And if any single one of you say, that's me, then you get up out of your seat and you come forward. Jesus is calling I wonder if he's calling you. Gannon, would you lead us in song? Church, would you be in prayer? If your heart is beating, he's calling and speaking to you. Gannon. Just one last option, because it doesn't fail after every service. Amen. We see you coming. It doesn't fail after every service. Someone says to me, I know I should have gone forward. Someone said to me last week, I was just too embarrassed. We want to support you. And God is calling you to take a step of faith. And Celine is down here dancing, waiting for you to come. If that's you, we just want to give you an opportunity. Amen. We see you. Yeah, amen.
Hey, I, I want to lead you guys in a prayer. Yeah, come on. Amen. Because this is a prayer of faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Yeah, come on down, brother. Hey, hey. come on. Good job. And in our faith, we talk to God through prayer. So all I want to do is lead you. And if you would just say these words after me, but just let it be your heart. He catches every tear because he cares for you. Church, would you support us as we pray? Just let them know you've got their back. You're with them. And would you pray with us? Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I want to turn my life around. And I want to turn towards you. Thank you for dying for me as the Son of God and rose again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, we'd just like to give you a, a Bible and a Bible study and kind of catch up your mind and your heart with what just happened in your spirit. Pastor Pat is here. You'll be back with your friends in just a minute. Would you go with Pastor Pat just so we can pray with you before you head out in your day? God bless you, church. Would you give them a pause to go? Hey, gang, here at Calvary Chapel South Bay, we memorize scripture. Now, do you guys remember last week's? Whoa, so difficult, right? Okay, I don't know about you, but all week long, as I got thirsty, I was praising God. I loved it. It was a great challenge for me. Now, this week, take a look at our scripture. I made it real difficult. John 19.30, say it with me. It is excellent. Our challenge for the week, would you take a look? Challenge to change. Don't give up press on. Think of what Jesus went through to get to the place to say it is finished. Let him be your standard bearer and no matter what you're going through, you pronounce to the enemy this week, it is finished. Amen. God bless you. Let's worship. I'll meet you out in the foyer after this song.